<clears throat> Good afternoon, blog viewers. Um, I'm going to return a video for a few months here in the summertime. Um, <clears throat> I think we did that last summer and it was kind of fun and useful to do it. Um, appreciate everyone's uh, viewership of the blog and readership. Um, certainly has progressed quite a lot in different ways over time. I think it will continue to evolve uh, as, as the <clears throat> years go by. And I uh, appreciate everyone's comments and readership and, and encouragement um, so far. And uh, I, I love doing it, so um, I'll just continue doing it until <laughs> I get tired of it or uh, it becomes boring, and I doubt that'll, that'll pretty much ever happen. So um, today we're going to talk about uh, moderation as, as one of the virtues. Um, I haven't really talked about it as much as some of the other ones. <clears throat> talked a lot about self-creation and love and freedom and re recently freedom I think and uh, and some of the some of the other virtues but moderation kind of talked about in the beginning and sort of haven't talked about as much yet but it was one of the central virtues for the Greeks the ancient Greek philosophers Plato and Aristotle um, it's one of the four virtues uh, discussed or identified by Plato uh, in, in the Platonic dialogues as essential uh, virtues of human life uh, justice, courage, moderation, and wisdom. Of course, for Plato, justice and wisdom were pretty uh, one almost, uh, with, with justice being the condition of soul where uh, reason ruled your soul. Reason ruled almost everything you did. Um, reason was in charge of your life, and uh, reason determined on its own uh, what was the best way to live, and justice was that state of soul where you... Uh, enacted within your life uh, what uh, what reason had determined and you acted accordingly um, but moderation was uh, was a virtue that uh, I think is um, was discussed uh, was considered more of a virtue in those times and less so now I think because it, it does conflict I think to some extent with with freedom with with uh, passion with love with self-creation with uh, self-expression and so uh, moderation might be getting less attention nowadays. So we'll start uh, start the video post this summer by talking about it. Um, of course, when talking about moderation, you have to discuss anger at some point because being angry is obviously, undeniably, one of the clearest examples of uh, losing one's sense of moderation. Uh, no one would claim that someone that's literally in the throes of some angry fit uh, is is acting moderately at the time, um, and so one question would be: What is anger? What is uh, what kind of definitional precision? Everyone knows, in some sense, what anger is. Everyone experiences it. Everyone has felt it. Everyone has has seen it. We all know it, but at at a level of definitional precision, how can you define it? How can you um, know it in, in, in a precise term. And I think one, one way to define it would be at a very deep level, it's, it's a behavioral response. Um, it's some behavioral enactment or response to some uh, real or perceived injury to the self that has happened either within reality, within observable reality, or within some reality that only the self knows or has experienced, some reality that is real only in the mind of the self experiencing it. I think that's sort of a first attempt to gain some precision on what, what anger is. Um, and uh, the key point is, of course, that there is, uh, even within that definition, you can see that there are um, some differences. There's not all expressions of anger are equal. There are expressions of anger where there is an actual injury within reality that the self is reacting to, and there are some um, there are moments of anger where the, the injury is only perceived in the mind and it's not actually occurred anywhere else. Uh, and so those might warrant a different sort of assessment of how justi justifiable the anger is. That itself leads to the question of, is all anger bad? Is all, every display of anger um, to be condemned and to be wished away and eradicated? And I don't think that's correct either. Um, is uh, anger can be the correct uh, res behavioral response of the self to some situation within reality, within something that's actually happened, within some observable reality outside of your mind, um, that uh, that would be appropriate. Um, example would be something like 
you train, you are in charge of training and supervising and mentoring a coworker at work. You do a great job doing it. You spend a lot of time and effort and uh, energy into the process. You, you, um, you show them all the tricks of the trade, all the things that you've laboriously learned. You take them to lunch. You do all these things. You, you offer your cell phone and and you, you know, if you have any questions, let me know. And after all this, um, you basically you've ensured that they are ready to do a good job. After all this happens, person steals from the company, you get blamed for it, <clears throat> and then well, do you have a right to be angry at that point? I think you do. I think you you did everything you could. You you trusted the person. You worked to uh, you know better their uh, ability to do the job, and they they abused all that trust and all that attention. Um, and I think you have a right to be angry for a brief period at this person and in a non-physically abusive way. You could say something to the person like, I can't believe you did this, you let me down, uh, I can't believe you would do that, That's, um, I don't want to have any other relations with you, um, uh, you know, we're done or whatever. And that would be an appropriate response. Um, if you weren't even that angry, if you weren't angry even in that situation, um, one could question whether you care about anything, whether you have any existential emotion or any caring about anything that's happening to you, happening to yourself as it's uh, occurring within reality. So what can we learn from this example? Uh, I think the key though to the example is um, the key to good anger or appropriate anger, maybe not, no anger is really good in that sense, but the key to responsible anger, reasonable anger is ensuring you first, ensuring you have a legitimate basis for the anger. Um, there is some event or action within reality that you've seen or that happened that gives you a right to be angry, which there was in this case. And ensuring, secondly, that your uh, angry, your behavioral response of anger is, is bounded in scope and time to whatever the slight was or whatever the situation giving rise to the anger. It can't be sort of a temporally unbounded, limitless, um, scopeless anger that extends way beyond the time or way beyond the event of what of what happens. So that's that's sort of the key to reasonable anger, I think. And um, we're going to turn to Kohut today. He talks about narcissistic rage and he talks about anger in the context of of a of a, uh, as it being uh, certain forms of pathological anger being uh, sort of all persuasive, all consuming anger at the world and other people being a form of a narcissistic injury and narcissistic psychological disorder. And so we're going to look at uh, Kohut today for what he can uh, teach us about anger. And one thing he says, um, this is in his book, uh, Self-Psychology and the Humanities. And in his essay, Thoughts on Narcissism and Narcissistic Rage, um, he concludes with a uh, definition of chronic narcissistic rage. He writes, we are thus witnessing the gradual establishment of chronic narcissistic rage, one of the most pernicious afflictions of the human psyche. Let me read that again. One of the most pernicious afflictions of the human psyche, either in its still endogenous and preliminary form as grudge and spite, or externalized and acted out in disconnected vengeful acts or in a cunningly plotted vendetta. vendetta. So this psychiatrist, the psychologist, one of the most revered of the um, of the last 30, 40 years describes sort of this all-consuming anger and rage as one of the most pernicious afflictions of the human psyche, unbounded, he calls it, externalized, acted out in various disconnected <coughs> uh, angry acts and, uh, and vendettas held around. And so this is, again, the form of anger that uh, we would try to avoid and would certainly not would fit within the virtue of moderation. Um, how does this thing actually develop? He sort of describes it here at the end, but how does this, how does someone, well, no one's born like this, no one's born with chronic narcissistic rage. It's not, not something that's written, again, we've been talking a lot about DNA, it's not something that's programmed into your DNA that you would act in this way. Um, what is it, how is it that a self would develop within reality to have this kind of narcissistic rage? And I think we start out with sort of one of um, Kohut's central ideas on, on the self, and that is that, it says on 106, uh, that the self has a sort of exhibitionism and, and grandiosity. Every self has sort of a, a desire to display itself to others, to seek um, approval, to sort of try great things and grand things. And, and that's mainly in the, in, the, in the portion of childhood one sees that. He says, exhibitionism in a broad sense can be regarded as a principal narcissistic dimension of all drives as the expression of a narcissistic emphasis on the aim of the drive rather than on its object. 
And in discussing that over the next few pages, he talks again about how the child, um, uh, you know, kids think they're, ba you know, they're basically think they're, you know, the rulers of the world. Kids do, they, you know, in a sense they are with, with the way their parents treat them. They're coddled, made to feel special, unique, very powerful. Anything is possible to the child that parents teach their kids anything is possible. You can be, you know, all you can be. All n n There's no limits to the self. And they can become and do anything. They can they can change at any point, um, and uh, that is sort of one accepted way of being a good parent is encouraging your kid in, in sort of these grandiose and and self uh, powerful dimensions and exhibitionism of the self, um, uh, responding well to that and mirroring that, which is a concept that Kohitz uh, talked about a lot and we've talked about on the blog is. A good parent will mirror that uh, uh, while the child is developing. Will not shut that down. Will will encourage the child in his uh, in his uh, uh, his efforts to um, uh, become a greater and grander and more powerful, and and to develop various uh, various um, uh, talents uh, of that sort. Um, but it, but then at another point, um, it's clear that you know every child, every person has certain limitations of their abilities and what what they can achieve. And then, so how do you respond to that? How do you respond to being raised as a child in this way and being taught that everything is possible, nothing is impossible? Um, and then how do you respond to your limitations? How do you respond to the fact that in reality, not within your mind anymore, not within your parents' mind, but within reality, not everything is possible for you. Not everything is achievable. Not everything is... Do, uh, you can't... The world doesn't turn based on what you want from it. The world is not structured in a way that is maximally suited to just suit your desires and what you want. The world is operating under the you know influence of hundreds, of billions of people making billions of decisions, all for their own interests or other people's interests. There's no, the world is not moving toward uh, the fulfillment of any single person's uh, objectives. Uh, neither is nature or the whole of reality is neither doing that either. So how do you, how do you respond to that when, when that kind of child um, in, you know, confronts um, that sort of reality. And one response is to, I think the response that COVID thinks is, is appropriate and, and psychologically healthy, is to recognize our limits to the self and pursue and dial down goals in a certain realistic manner. And, uh, and still, while still pushing to achieve and to uh, grow and to, and to develop in, in a maximal way possible, it's still done within the context of recognizing limitations, not only to oneself, but as also as to how the world is sort of operating within sort of uh, the context we just discussed as not being, again, not being spun and run just to suit one single person's objectives, whatever those might be. That would be one response. Another response would be this this narcissistic rage that Kohut talks about, and that response uh, is obviously uh, one that he doesn't look with, he doesn't approve of. Um, and uh, the problem in, in within that person is that they they react with rage, constant, almost perpetual anger and rage at everything that's going on around them. Um, the problem is not them, the problem is not any limitation, the problem is not how they're pursuing certain objectives, the problem is not what they're going for, what their goal is. They're, none of those things are the problem. The problem is the world. The problem is other people. The problem is um, reality. The problem is how things are structured. So, so they, uh, instead of locating any of the fault within the self, it all gets uh, projected outward. There's all this rage at the environment. There's all this rage at reality. There's all this rage at other people, and this becomes sort of a chronic narcissistic rage that Kohut talks about. And we're going to read a couple passages that bring that out on page uh, 143 of Thoughts on Narcissism and Narcissistic Rage. Kohut writes, uh, Narcissistic rage occurs in many forms. They all share, however, a specific psychological flavor which gives them a distinct position within the wide realm of human aggressions. The need for revenge, for righting a wrong, for undoing a hurt by whatever means, and a deeply anchored, unrelenting compulsion, unrelenting compulsion in the pursuit of all these aims, which gives no rest to those who have suffered a narcissistic injury. These are the characteristic features of narcissistic rage in all its forms, and which set it apart from all other kinds of aggressions.
Um, he continues on 145, the heightened sadism, the adoption of a policy of preventative attack, the need for revenge, and the desire to turn a passive experience into an active one do not, however, fully account for some of the most characteristic forms, features of narcissistic rage. In its typical forms, this is again, he's talking about narcissistic rage, there is utter disregard for reasonable limitations and a boundless wish to redress an injury and to obtain revenge. On 149, he continues, or describing the psychodynamic pattern in different words, we can say, although everyone tends to react to narcissistic injuries with embarrassment and anger, the most intense experiences of shame and the most violent forms of narcissistic rage arise in those individuals for whom a sense of absolute control over an archaic environment is indispensable because the maintenance of self-esteem and indeed of the self depends on the unconditional availability of the approving mirroring self-object or the mirror merger permitting idealized one. And then he continues, the most severe narcissistic resistances against analysis arise in those patients whose archaic need to claim omniscience and total control had remained comparatively unaltered uh, during development. Um, and I think all of these concepts, so basically, uh, I think this goes to some of the things we talked about before, is, is the unbounded nature of the rage as opposed to the example we gave earlier with sort of the temporally finite scope in scope and and uh, and reasonableness and, and time of the the coworker example uh, this narcissistic range has no cohort uh, discusses this several times it's totally boundless it's totally uh, uncontrolled it's totally um, um, uh, just all consuming and uh, there's this need for almost a need for revenge uh, it's driven he says sometimes by the need by this by a person who wants actually to have or wants to feel total control of their environment which is a totally ridiculous notion that anyone could have total control over reality or the actions of seven other billion people uh, and how things are going to turn out um, uh, and sort of this archaic uh, sort of infantile conception of how the, wor the world works results in this kind of narcissistic rage. And I think all of this ties into what we discussed yesterday. We made the distinction between everything, the realm of everything, where everything exists within, with the, that has organic reality, that, has, um, that can be observed and that's real, and then the world of nothing, which is totally separate, like two separate circles that never touch realm of nothing where the ideas can just certain ideas can exist only within your mind and they're not they're totally divorced um, uh, from any sort of rules of logic or common sense or or, or observation of the world or facts uh, realities of life realities of science realities of, 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 of basically um, um, anything um, uh, but these but these ideas can exist within within what's really nothing within the mind and uh, the product usually of that kind of um, uh, thing, that sort of uh, holding on to nothing, is usually something very bad and, and something that we should all try to avoid. And I think anger in this sort of uh, narcissistic form is a very good example of nothing. It is a form of nothing. It's, it's fueled by nothing. It's generated by nothing, generated by ideas that are completely nonsensical, um, this sort of deep-seated narcissistic uh, anger and um, view of the world is a total nothing. It should be labeled as such. We should move beyond it. We shouldn't uh, sit in it. And if we ever recognize any, even sort of the onset of it, we should, uh, we should, uh, as part of our work of supervising our own minds, making sure our minds stay within the world of being, making sure our mind stays within the world of everything and good and perfection and strives ever for perfection. If we even see the glint of this, we should uh, we should recognize it for what it is and try quickly to to get out of it. So uh, uh, that's it for today, and uh, hope uh, people like the videos. And uh, we'll talk to you shortly. Bye bye.